All right, good evening, everybody. We will call the Belvedere City Council Committee of the Whole meeting of October 14, 2024, to order. If the clerk will help me with the roll call, please, Erica. Albertini? Here. Brereton? Here. Flurry? Here. Frank? Here. Freeman? Here. Gramkowski? Here. McGee? Here. Mulhall? Here. Peterson? Here. Stevens? Here. Ten present. Okay, thank you. Under public comment, we have Dan Snow uh, wanted to address the council. If you'll, whoop. Good evening. Good evening. Name's Dan Snow. I live at 1115 East 4th Street. On the agenda is the pathway issue that's going to potentially go underneath the State Street Bridge. I was just hoping to make sure that adequate attention is given to safety. Um, I know there's no real good option beyond going under the bridge, but um, it, concerns have been brought to my attention about the safety of that and being the one that gets mugged or anything else that might occur. So having it well lit and uh, possibly a camera or something to help deter any um, issues. I know the park district doesn't appear to have any issues, um, but just to bring that out. so. Um, it's addressed. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Public forum, uh, we have none. Reports of officers, boards, and special committees. Item one, building planning zoning unfinished business. We have none. Item two, building planning zoning new business. Uh, item A, building department. Update, uh, Mr. Countryman, good evening. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Council. For the month of September, the department issued 102 permits for a construction value just under $5 million. 86 of those were residential, 16 were commercial, five single family homes, um, some commercial projects that are, I'll give you an update. <clears throat> the club car wash is open. We're pulling final inspections for the hibachi um, grill out on North State. Midland Bank is at Drywall. Uh, the daycare on Pearl is at Ruffin. We issued the permit for O'Reilly's. Uh, the fire alarm and sprinkler system for Yukon. Um, for property maintenance, we have issued tickets for residents housing chickens. Um, the hunt, the old hunt residents, if anybody's aware of that on West Hurlbut. Uh, we have some issues at 300 block of Van Buren, 1000 block of Washington, 1025 West 5th Street. Excuse me, I didn't want to give an address. 716, 700 block of South State, 300 block of East Madison, 200 block of East 2nd Street, Klein's Ford Subdivision, 2000 block of North State, 1000 block of Belvedere. 1700 block of South State, 2000 block of North State, and 600 block of Buchanan. And I'll uh, open for any questions. Anybody has any questions for Mr. Countryman? Now would be the time. Okay. All right. Thank you, Kip. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mayor. Item B, uh, Planning Department update, uh, Ms. Delrose, good evening. Good evening. Um, there's three cases that will be before the council starting next week. Um, one is a rezoning at uh, 155 East Hurlbut, which extends into Van Buren. It's uh, used for commercial purposes now, but it's zoned residential, so they're cleaning that up. One is a very large tax amendment. It's about 42, 48 pages long. Um, because of all the cross-referencing in the code. Uh, so that will be before you. Lots of cleanup, basically. And then uh, special use for gaming on Logan Avenue. Uh, also processing two cases for next month. Um, it's uh, taking two lots, combine them into one, so that a very large accessory structure can be built on that. Um, and then... Uh, Kip said there's some final inspections done, some downtown overlay reviews. Obviously, the facade grant projects are still moving along. 
So you've been seeing them out in the street at Logan and State for the tuck pointing and everything. Um, the Historic Preservation Commission is still working on their 2024 awards program. Hopefully the invitations will be in any day now so those can get sent out. And uh, working a lot with uh, phone calls from potential uh, commercial retail and food establishments um, that are not uh, definite yet, but there's uh, been a lot of interest lately. Okay. If there's any questions for Ms. Delrose, now would be the time. Okay. Thank you, Gina. Appreciate it. Item three, public works unfinished business. We have none. Item four, P public works new business. Item A, public works update. Uh, good evening, Director Anderson. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, two things. One was on your desk tonight, the 2024 leaf collection. The dates, uh, that's going to begin on the south side of town the week of October 28th. And then we'll jump back and forth between south side and north side. Uh, for basically the month of November, uh, cleaning up those leaves. But again, that's going to start on the south side the week of October 28th, and this will be in the shop or it'll be on the city's website as well as the city's newsletter as well. So that's upcoming. Uh, branches were completed last this past week. We finished up our branch collection program. The other thing uh, for the update is in the latest issue of the IML Municipal Review Magazine, that you all receive. There's a very good article in there, a summary of uh, lead service line replacement, which are one of our topics of discussion tonight. Um, it just provides a good overview of uh, where it's at and uh, the process, and uh, it's a good reference uh, to hang on to there. And that's all I have uh, if there's any questions. Okay. Questions? Uh, Alderwoman Freeman? Thank you. Um, Director Anderson, can you talk a little bit about or give a little update on our um, PFAS and the class action lawsuit um, with 3M and DuPont, if we are involved in that and um, when we can expect any news on that or if we're not involved in that, why? Uh, we are involved in that as a, as a, as a having a water system where all the municipalities are, are involved. Um, with that so our information has been submitted it's been accepted for for both those entities there's a total of four entities I believe that's got subject to class action lawsuit the other two entities um, the parameters of that haven't been established yet so we're still waiting on that information but for the first two that are out there we have submitted and uh, just going through that process any other questions for mr. Anderson Okay, thank you, Brent. Item B, lead service line inventory and initial plan in your packet <clears throat> is a memo from Mr. Anderson, um, dated 10-1 of 24, regarding lead service line inventory and the initial plan um, that was submitted, uh, that we will submit. Uh, anyhow, Mr. Anderson? Thank you, Your Honor. Again, uh, a memo in the packet. Um, we have submitted our current lead service line inventory and our lead service line replacement plan to the IEPA as required. A copy of the portion of the lead service line replacement plan is attached for your reference. Uh, the part that's left out is the actual, all the sheets of the actual inventory where we're at to date with all the responses. That's included as a subsection of the, of the uh, plan, but I did not make a copy of that just for uh, conservation paper. Also attached are samples of the IEPA required property owner notification letters that have to be sent to all identified properties with either lead or galvanized services as well as those properties yet to be identified. Based on our current results, we are expecting approximately 1,500 services will require replacement. So the, the attachment, the letters, there's three letters depending on if they have lead, if they have galvanized, or if they are unknown at this time. And those, as it states in the memo, have to be sent out. Those are gonna go out and mail tomorrow. Um, so I wanted all the council members to be aware of that. In case you get any questions, you can refer the questions uh, to the Public Works Office. But again, that's another requirement of, of the EPA as part of this program. Um, the initial plan was due the first of the month, and they've been submitted. Final plans are actually due three years from now. Um, and then uh, the memo in here indicates that um, 
uh, the current estimated cost for a service line replacement from the water main to the main valve in the residence is $9,800. And according to the parameters, which were recently updated uh, this past week, uh, Congress, the um, U.S. EPA has indicated that they want a 10-year cap on the replacement program. So including the three years for, from th it's 10 years from the final report due, so technically it's 13 years. I know it's referenced in my memo here for 17 years, but it's actually going to be 13 years. So that'll change the numbers uh, a little bit to get that done. The Bipartisan Infrastructure Act allocated $15 billion in funding for lead service replacement. This funding is expected to be available for the next three years. Attached to this memo is a copy of the funding nomination form for public water supply loan program, which is the first step in obtaining these funds. The requested amount is $1.2 million, which includes engineering, design, and construction services for the first year of the replacement program. Again, we'll update that request amount based on this new information. But that is our plan currently. Right now, the majority of the cost uh, identified the 14700000 The majority of that cost is for work to be done on private property, which is required as part of this program. And uh, our goal would be to solicit grant funding to hopefully uh, uh, pay the majority of those costs, if not all the costs. Experience right now is that the uh, through those programs, if they're awarded, they do include 100% principal forgiveness, similar to what we've seen so far on our new well no, number 11 activities. Um, but again, the first step in the process is the funding nomination form, which uh, uh, we are planning on submitting on behalf of the city. If there's any questions where we're at right now. Alderman Peterson. Well, first off, you know, if this is going to be an, just another unfunded mandate, it really is worth objecting to if they're not going to cover it because it sounds like from what you're saying we have to have the bulk of this ready to go in the first three years before that uh, infrastructure act money expires so is that is, is that what you're saying we want to try to target the private pay one so we can get get those those done and still have 10 years to deal with the rest of it on our end well the 10 years again is the is the time frame that's allowed right now they've they've identified funding for the first three years uh, my guess, best guess right now is they're going to continue to identify funding uh, for this program because it involves, uh, it's a lot of work for, for basically everybody across the United States. So um, I think the, the funding is going to be identified, but as of right now, there's three years worth. So we will want to try to take advantage of, of that as best as we can. Continue. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, when you look at the $9,800 for, for an average resident, it's a pretty big bite for, for, for most people. And you can drive around Belvedere and probably guess the properties that probably have the lead pipes or, or copper or galvanized, and they're probably not going to have readily have that extra $9,800 if we can't cover that from the, the grant funds. I mean, the, with the percentage of people and the kids in District 100 that qualify for the federal free lunch program, you know, you can understand that they're, they're putting something on a, you know, really middle class to lower middle class neighborhoods that can absolutely least afford this. Correct. And that's why I think there's going to be, there, and there's other funding sources available out there too, through CDBG funds and some other grant funds. And I don't know if it's good news or bad news, but the majority of Belvedere has been identified as a disadvantaged community also. So that puts us in a, in a good spot uh, for additional funding as well. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Just by way of an, an editorial, I mean, they, the state found $275 million for a make-believe metro train that they already say they've funded, and very few people are probably actually going to plan on riding that thing, but everybody needs a good public water supply and with, without lead. I mean, it would make much more sense to address the basics and do them well than address the, you know, the foo-foo and, you know, and the smoke and mirrors. Correct, and that's again. We will we will uh, attempt to make those attempts to get the dollars that we need to get this project done. Okay, thank you. Any other questions, Alderwoman Freeman? So, Brent, um, fourteen point seven million over three years of available money is like four point nine million a year. Is there a cap on how much we can ask for? Why are we only asking for one point two million in the first year? The well, thought was uh, back before they, they changed it to the 10 um, to take it out for the, for the extended period of time. Basically, the first go around, um, 
it was to get basically acclimated to the system, make sure we get all the understand all the ins and outs and the the particulars about the specific program, what we need to do, what we don't need to do, because again, we have to have uh, um, go to the, each of the private property owners. They have to be part and parcel to this program. We can't just do it on our own. We need the assistance of those property owners as well. Um, so we kept the scope down, um, somewhat reduced, just to go through the program to make sure we we have everything in in line before we bite off a larger section of town, if you will. Um, and then um, I did my math on the 17 years, but um, regardless of that, 6% of 1,500 is 90 homes a year that we're looking to complete, right? Whatever that number comes up, I haven't got to those particulars as of yet. And then I'm wondering how you got to the 1,500 because the, the lead and the GRR is 747. So are you taking 753 from the unknown and assuming that they are um, lead? So we took the percentages of the responses that we've gotten to date and with the unknowns and with the ages and did some correlations. And as of right now, based on what we've seen so far with, with the actual uh, inspections that have been submitted to us, that's the numbers we're, we've arrived at. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. I have one quick question. I'm looking at the replacement for the uh, homeowner itself. Can the homeowner refuse to have this done and decide they don't want it because they don't have the money or they just, they have their own filtering system and don't want to bother with replacing the lead lines? Can they opt out? There is an opt out, but it's a process to get there to that point. And then there's that puts some requirements on both the property owner and the municipality on the opt-out and filtering and so forth and monitoring of that. So again, um, this will have to all go out and it'll be in concert with the property owners and explain all the options to them and see where it ends up at. Thank you very much. And just ongoing, the the inventory is ongoing um, to get all those uh, so far that we don't unidentified. They all will have to be identified within this three-year time frame. And we keep getting in uh, more responses on, on a daily basis. So the information is constantly being updated in the inventory form. Alderman Fleury. Just wanted to clarify. So in the memo, it says it's $9,800 per residence, but the city is responsible for that cost, not the homeowner. And now we're seeking these grant funds to pay for it. So it, there's not an increased tax burden. But at this point, it's the city's problem, not the resident's problem, correct? No. So if you look at the, let's see, if you go to page number... If you go to page four and you see the, the cost breakdown and it's got the total public side opinion of probable cost and the total private side probable cost shutoff valve to the house and the main water main to the shutoff valve. So there's the breakdown. So it's $1,900 on the private property side, $7,900 on the public side. So the city would be responsible for what's in the public right of way. On the public side, the private property would be the private owner would be responsible for what's on the private property side. So we're looking at a box approximately nineteen hundred dollars based on this es estimate on an average for an average cost on the private property side. Now, what we may not encumber and what we have to take into account is some of the private on the private side. It could go through a driveway. It could there could be things between the property line and into the house that will have a big cost variation in there. But as of right now, on an average, the cost estimate is the $1,900 on the private property side. And technically, they would be, property owners would be responsible for that cost unless we are able to obtain funding uh, through grants and through other programs to pay for that. And that is our goal. Thank you for clarifying. Okay. Any other questions for Director Anderson? Alderman Albertini? Thank you. I have one more question. You're talking about grants for the city and everything. Will will there be any type of grants that the public can apply for in the future to cover this nineteen hundred dollars? Or will there be some way they can or somewhere they can go to maybe 
be reimbursed for this? Well, again, that's what the city, that's what we're going to do on the private property owner's behalf is to go out and seek funding. Thank you. Okay. And also, Brent, uh, I know that uh, they had talked about a 17-year um, was the first blush that we had regarding the time frame, and now it's down to 10. Um, well, it's, act it's actually 13. 13. 13. What are the, what are the chances that uh, as we go forward that they will see that perhaps um, this, it, is a, it is a mandate, uh, whether or not it's, it's funded, hopefully it is, that's our goal, but um, as they go forward with um, some, of the, uh, some of the intangibles they may run into, we may run into of them uh, extending that back. Uh, have you heard any talk about that? Well, as, as we found out just like again this last week, they've, they've already made some changes, some amendments to it, and the fact that it's not final until three years from now gives them three years to, come to, to make changes, make alterations, and so we'll have to just uh, uh, respond to those as they come along. Okay. All righty, any, any other questions for Director Anderson? Okay, hearing none, Brent, did you want any action? Uh, we don't need any on this this evening, just uh, FYI, correct? Correct, and just be aware that those letters are going out, and if you do have calls, get calls, you can certainly refer them to the Public Works Office. Okay, thank you. And uh, next we have uh, item C, sewer rate increase, step three. Uh, in your packet uh, was a memo from Director Anderson, uh, dated 216 of 24, regarding sewer rate increase, step three. We had discussed some of the, um, some of the issues uh, that we have with having to fund um, water and sewer. And uh, with that being said, uh, Director Anderson. Thank you, Your Honor. And actually, we're going to jump to item D first because D and C go together. So, because um, it's basically one and the same project. So if you jump to jump ahead to D, which is our memo for the change order number five for our 2018 improvement project, which is what the, we acquired the uh, loan to cover the cost of. Um, change order number five is the final change order for our 2018 improvement project. And the change order includes the relocation of a sampler line in the main equipment building at a cost of $1,468.43. Well, replacement of the sludge withdrawal pipe in the digester, $13,256.25. And as we talked about before, a credit for removing the 20-inch valve replacement from the contract, which was a $10,000 credit to the contract. The change order represents an increase, a net increase to the contract in the amount of $4,724.68. It's been, the request has been reviewed and recommended by our engineers for this project. I would recommend approval of change order number five for the 2018 improvement project in the amount of $4,724.68. This work will be paid for from the IEPA loan for this project. And that uh, brings us to our final contract price of $3,954,231.83, which represents a 5.7% increase over the original contract price of $3,740,000. Uh, we had anticipated um, the cost of this project to be slightly over $4 million, so it did come in under what we had originally anticipated budget-wise. Okay, thank you. Uh, with that being said, I would uh, welcome a motion uh, that would recommend approval of the change order number five for the wastewater treatment plant 2018 improvement project in the amount of $4,728.68. This work will be paid for from the IEPA loan for this project. Motion by Alderman Stevens, second by Alderman Peterson. Thank you both. Any questions uh, regarding the change order five? Uh, it's on the table. Alderman Peterson. Is that 20-inch uh, valve gonna still be is that going to be pro provided just on standby, or is it completely taken out of the? So, um, you weren't on the on the council um, for when this discussion took place. The, it was in the original contract, and the contractor came back to the city asking for a requestional or for additional funding um, 
to do the work based on, on um, conflicts within the excavation area that uh, were not uh, known at the time that the contract was bid to the tune of over three hundred thousand dollars is what he was asking for and so we we went out on our own uh, got some prices proposals from contractors and uh, agreed uh, accepted the cost of from NTRAC construction the amount of seventy five thousand dollars to do that valve replacement so the the contractor Williams Brothers had invested quite a bit of time and effort into uh, um, changing the valve. They were not successful, uh, and in the end, they offered up the $10,000 credit to get out from under that requirement. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alderwoman Freeman? So, Brent, are, are we about to wrap this project up? How close are we to completion, or can we anticipate any more change orders? No, this is the final one. This is why um, this is before you this, as the final with the final contract price. Uh, the only thing we're waiting on now is the paperwork end of things to be done. There's some warranty information and some other dates and stuff that have to be filled out for that and then uh, sent down to uh, EPA for their approval. And as we get into uh, item C here, um, they've already taken that into account and they've already um, gave us a uh, preliminary. In fact, we've already got our first uh, invoice for the first payment um, and based on the, the preliminary final numbers. So the only thing that's going to change um, on the repayment is this 47-2468. If council approves that, that'll be added on to the total amount um, on the borrow, and we'll talk about that next. Okay, thank you. So we have a motion uh, on the floor. Any other questions regarding the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. Aye. And if there's any opposed, motion passed. Thank you. Okay, now we go back to C in the sewer rate, rate increase step three. Uh, the water sewer rate review for our 2025 proposed budget, uh, at that time proposed, included a three-step increase for our sanitary sewer rates. The first two steps have been implemented, and the third step was to be based on the repayment amount of the IVEPA loan project. This project has been substantially completed, and we have received the financial summary from the IEPA for this project, a copy attached. So this is the pre-final that we have received, the summary, and then it will be finalized once we send down the paperwork for this final change order. But it's only going to change to the amount of that 4000 um, good news is we have received $621,892.50 in principal forgiveness. Uh, so basically that's a grant to the city that we do not have to repay. And our annual loan repayment amount will be approximately $198,843.12, which is paid in two installments uh, every year. The repayment amount will require a rate increase of 20 cents per HCF to cover that expense. Originally, we had anticipated a cost of 24 cents, uh, so we were able to reduce that down to 20 cents. And the new rate of $3.36 per hundred cubic feet represents a 6.3 increase, and the average monthly bill will increase $1.60 or 5 cents per day, which brings the total sewer increase would be $19.20 for the year. I would therefore recommend a sanitary sewer rate increase of 20 cents HCF, 100 cubic feet, effective January 1st, 2025, as required by our EPA loan agreement, numbers 173623. And like I said, we have received our first invoice, first bill for repayment, and our second bill will be due on uh, May 1st, so that's why we're going to institute the rate increase on January 1 to cover that installment due on May 1st. Okay, thank you, Mr. Anderson. Uh, if I could have a motion to that effect, please. Motion by Alderman Peterson, uh, second by Alderwoman Frank. Thank you both. Um, and this will have to go be done and drafted into ordinance form and come back to council. Brent, just to refresh uh, our memory, when is the last time that we've had uh, a rate increase? Uh, before before this series of increases uh, during this fiscal year. Uh, current, um, I think it was 2011, I believe. Okay. Okay, thank you. Alderman Fleury. Thank you. I know you've answered this several times when we've talked about the rate increase, but so what would happen if we don't raise the rate? 
if we don't raise the rate, then um, you'll have to have a, a commitment of funding, which would mean you're probably going to have to do some cuts or possibly lay off or something to, to be able to free up that money to make the payment. Right. And then as we talked before, because I know we talked about this in the budget last year and there was going to be three steps to it and was approved some time back. Um, but with this, um, the rate increase, basically, again, the way the sewer fund works is that you're not making money. You're just covering your expenses to break even, and that's how everything's set up. So it's not like a uh, an opportunity to raise more. It's just, just what you need to cover the sewer and water within the city, right? That's correct. Water and sewer rates, the water and sewer utility portions of the city's budget are just self-funded through those rates. And uh, we are charged with setting you know, the rates as reasonable as we can. Well, we can't overcharge. We can't surcharge uh, for other projects. It all has to be related to the water and sewer. So any time that we um, um, inc incur these kind of costs, take on under the, these kind of projects, then, um, uh, then we have to have the initial f additional funding to cover those costs. And okay. again, we will be looking at rates again, as we do every year, through the budget process, where we're at, what we need, and where we're going. Okay, again, thanks again for explaining that. And just in case there are any citizens tune in for the first time that didn't see it the first couple of times, but why there is a rate increase, and like the mayor stated, it hasn't been a, a rate increase since 2011. So appreciate the hard work at Public Works of keeping those rates reasonable. And we do. We have we have uh, the most reasonable rates in the area for both water and sewer. And even with these increases, we are still highly competitive as far as our rate structure goes for our utilities. Thank you, Alderman Peterson. And all this has to fund is that bond payment, right? It's not like a, some of the other bonds where there would be a you know one fund for bond and interest and another one for O and M and another one for interest reserve and stuff. All we have to do is just cover that that annual payment with us, right? Correct. That's what this is specifically tiered to, and that's based on the, as part of your loan agreement when you use a low interest loan program for funding. Uh, going forward, and this is a very competitive, very good program to be a part of, um, and you basically get in line, and in fact, we've, we've started the process to get in line for the next improvement uh, that we're going to be rec bringing to Council for recommendation uh, for funding. And uh, they changed the bond payment structures now going forward. We're currently there are 20-year paybacks, and they are going to be going to a 30-year payback. Um, so that's anything going forward now will be under the 30-year payback. Okay, thank you. Alderwoman Freeman. So I was hoping um, with the addition of some relatively large manufacturing facilities that um, we've added, and the anticipation of Stellantis reopening, um, as well as what um, was sold to us as a large water consumer um, that we annexed in, I think it was off Revlon Drive recently, um, that we might be able to forego this step three, but obviously you don't see that as the case. Um, no, the, the large water user is not, is not necessarily a large water user. Um, specifically on the water side. This is on the sanitary sewer side. Unfortunately, um, certainly the uh, um, Walmart facility uh, and, and additional employees there will help. Um, the anticipation is, yes, that uh, Stellantis will be back in operation with all these online that will hopefully, hopefully come back come back soon and that will forego any other adjustments, rate adjustments that will be needed in the future. Uh, we should be in a good spot, but again, if that doesn't happen, again, as through the budgetary process, we'll look at everything what we need, our upcoming expenses, uh, forecasting, and uh, um, we will make those requests accordingly. Okay, and I think it is important to note that hopefully um, we will have, um, you know, our largest water user and sewer, uh, with that, our sewer uh, user. Uh, they will be back online, but without them, uh, we, then uh, we can certainly uh, plan on at least meeting our obligations. So I think that's important. Uh, we've gone a long time. Uh, Belvedere's gone a long time without uh, any uh, rate increases, but at some point or other, um, as I had said before, when you open the spigot on your faucet or you flush the toilet, um, there's a certain obligation that you have to meet, 
meet and you cannot commingle uh, your funding. It strictly goes towards, uh, in this case, sewer, so wastewater treatment plant. So, any other questions? Uh, okay. So we have a motion on the floor then, uh, recommend a sanitary sewer increase of 20 cents per 100 cubic feet effective January 1st, 2025 as re required by our IEPA loan agreement, uh, number L173623. If there are no other questions, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 And if there's any opposed? Aye. Okay, motion passed, thank you. Item 4D, Kishwaukee Riverfront Path Extension in your memo from Director Anderson, dated 10-1 uh, of 24 regarding Kishwaukee Riverfront Path Extension, uh, goes into some of the funding that we've had in order to complete the Kishwaukee Riverfront Path from State Street to Main Street. And Director Anderson, if you'd like to expound. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, the history of this path extension goes way back, probably until the uh, um, mid to late 80s. Um, and uh, with the uh, sub shop property, um, sound like it's gonna, looks like it's going to be changing hands. Uh, the new owners of that property um, are in, have indicated a willingness to work with the city to get the necessary easements and stuff required to actually make that connection of the path um, from Main Street to State Street. And it'll include a path underneath the bridge, as uh, Mr. Snow indicated, as well as the alternate path around the, the perimeter of the uh, sub, sub shop property. Um, and that's shown on the attached, the alignments are shown on the, on the following two pages uh, behind the memo. And um, so we have applied for, we've received three grants, uh, thanks to Senator Stallman, totaling $780,000 to go towards this work. And we have applied with Belvedere Park District for an additional $200,000 grant. We just found out last week that uh, it looks like that grant will be awarded to the city. So we will have a total of uh, $980,000 available to us for the path. The estimated project cost is $1.1 million, and the city's share of this project cost is $120,000 and will be paid for from capital funds. Attached to this memo is a proposal from Arc Design Resources in the amount of $96,500 for the engineering design of the Kishwaukee Riverfront Path Extension. I would recommend approval of the engineering design proposal from Arc Design Resources in the amount of $96,500 for the Kishwaukee Riverfront Path Extension. This work will be paid for from grant funds and capital funds. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> As Citizen uh, Snow has pointed out, I have some concerns about the safety of the underpass under the bridge. Will there be some kind of gating to lock this out after surface hours of use, or is this going to be a 24-hour passage? Um, are we going to think about putting any kind of, you know, security cameras or anything, and are we going to have police increase through that in the late hours to prevent homeless from living under there? Uh, the path will be, be lighted, um, and the lighting will be similar to the path uh, that goes underneath Appleton now um, through the park district. Uh, so I don't foresee any, um, un you know, unforeseen issues that way. So I think it'll be it'll be well lit. It'll be, uh, um, um, I think it'll be, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? An acceptable usage. Uh, don't plan on any gates or anything at this point in time. Okay, so you'll feel the lighting will deter all these further things such as muggings, robberies, or people living under there. Oh, I could, I, I would probably defer to the police chief. He's probably got some words there. 
Well, obviously, I can't predict the future. All I can tell you is that uh, uh, to this date, I've yet to hear of any uh, uh, robberies, strong arm robberies, uh, aggravated batteries, criminal sexual assaults that occurred uh, underneath the uh, uh, Appleton Street Bridge there. So uh, one could assume uh, that, uh, uh, you know, if there is crime, it would be minimal. Hey, thank you very much. And then keep in mind they have an alternative path uh, that they're going to be able to take uh, in order to be able to get around the subway as well, correct, Brent? Yes, that's correct. And we, we designed it that way on purpose because we know at times of high water, uh, when, the, when the river's up, uh, the, ex the accessibility will not be there to go underneath the, underneath the bridge. So uh, that's why we have the alternative to go up and around. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Alderwoman Gramkowski. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Brent, did we get any other proposals from any other civil engineering firms? No, for design, for design services, we really can't go out for proposals because we can ask for solicits of letters of interest. Um, but because the um, um, uh, ARC has working on our parking lot improvements across right across the river, uh, they've already had some of the information done because of the work that they had to do there. Uh, so it seemed uh, most beneficial to us to have them work on this side of the river as well. Thank you. Yeah. Alderwoman Freeman. So Brent, do we have um, a plan for the developing the brownfield um, area there? Like, are we going to do anything with that, or is it just going to be just grass and? Right now, you're referring to the lease property. So the, the path is there, it's been paved, and that will connect, this, this section of path will actually connect to that. Um, we've been waiting to do any further improvements based on if there's any kind of development coming along. Uh, so that can be done in concert with whatever, however that property is redeveloped. We've had proposals over the years, as you're aware of, that have come, and it's nothing uh, has, has borne any fruit to this point. Uh, but we're still hopeful that something will happen, and perhaps with these amenities that we're doing in this section will lend itself to further amenities to the east. Continue. And so does this money, this $1.1 million, um, does that include, like, landscaping and vegetation and lighting and uh, everything to complete that whole path all the way through? It does. It, completes, it, it includes all of that. It includes a boulder edge along the shoreline for shoreline protection, erosion control, similar to what's through the park district's portion now uh, on their property. It'll be extended through this portion as well. Um, so yes, it's all inclusive. Thank you. Alderman Peterson, did you have your hand up? Thanks. I, I did have uh, three, three, three specific points to explore. And uh, was, did ARC solicit any user input before some of the preliminary design i saw they mentioned that they were going to do some of that but it, did some of that get done for the from the actual current users of the path so we've got some history there um based on on we've had uh, some brief conversations with the property owners of where the salvation army property is now and, and what's needed there we've had uh, discussions with the um purchasers of the SS subs property, which what's what we need there, what can be done there. And if you notice on the detail that was drawn up a sketch that was based on our conversations with them, that's the um, the third page, if you will, kind of highlights what's uh, be proposed there for the path and some retaining walls and stuff. Um, so as this part of this design is, is developed, yes, there will be schematics and stuff that will be brought to council. And then I was going to question you on, on if there's one single entity that has the ownership, maintenance, and jurisdiction of the whole thing, or is it split between the park and the city then? Or Yes, you are correct. So the park district currently holds the easement across the um, Salvation Army property. So, this, so that is why they applied for that 200000 grant. It was the name of them because they actually own the the rights to that easement. So they will be charged with the maintenance and upkeep of that portion. And then the city will be will take care of the SS subs and underneath the bridge through the through the state street right away. And the park district assumes on the if you notice on the second page here there's some there's some work that has to be done to get underneath the bridge with the path and some relocation efforts uh, by the dairy ripple. And so those areas once those are redone would be responsibility of the uh, park district as well. 
And then on the 30 day that they, they want this to be executed within 30 days of that letter, is that going to be, I think it was August 28th or something, is that, that's not a problem, right? Not a problem. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions for Director Anderson uh, regarding the motion on the floor? I will say that um, Senator Stottleman did uh, approach me and uh, we, we did, they did have some, some money that they wanted to spend uh, in our downtown area, and uh, they have. Um, they, so I am grateful uh, to him that uh, this path, the connection of the path, uh, has been something that's been discussed for a long time, but the funding obviously has always been an issue. So uh, I guess when you look at, as they say, bringing the bacon home, uh, in this case, uh, that's exactly what he has done, and I appreciate it. So we'll give him kudos. Any other uh, questions or comments? Alderman Fleury. Thank you. Uh, currently, there's some trees along the river between SS Subs and the Salvation Army all over to Main Street. Is that looking to maintain those tree lines there, or will that be removed for the path? Most of those trees there will be coming down. They're not that desirable, and uh, there will be a lot of trees and a lot of things going back. There will be a couple of them that have been identified to be saved, but the majority of those will be going. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions uh, on the motion? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, uh, motion to approve the engineering design proposal from Arc Design Resources in the amount of $96,500 for the Kishwaukee Riverfront Path Extension. The work will be paid for from grant funds and capital funds. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 And if there's any opposed, motion passed. Thank you. And then item F is in your packet uh, is a memo from Director Anderson dated uh, September 27, 2024 regarding Certificate of Satisfactory Completion of the uh, Kelly Farm Subdivision. I believe this is a housekeeping item, but uh, Director Anderson. Thank you, Your Honor. As, as stated in the memo, in accordance with Section 151.61B of the City Subdivision Control Ordinance, I do hereby certify that all of the public improvements required for the Kelly Farm Subdivision have been completed and the improvements have been inspected by this department and found to be in conformance to the approved construction plans for the subdivision. The developer has submitted his engineer certification as built construction plans and contractor's affidavit and lien waivers for the subdivision as required. And I would therefore recommend the City Council approve a resolution accepting the public improvements for Kelly Farm subdivision. And that subdivision is where General Mills is located, their new warehouse facility um, at US 20 and Irene. All right, uh, if I could have a motion. Uh to that effect, please. Motion by Alderman Stevens, second by Alderman Peterson. Thank you both. Uh, any questions, uh, any comments, any concerns regarding the motion on the floor? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by, say, by, by saying aye. 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 And if there's any opposed, motion passed, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Uh, item five, uh, other unfinished business. Uh, we have item A, elected official salary. In your memo, in your packet was a memo from City Attorney Drella, uh, <coughs> dated 10-10-10 of 2024 regarding automatic compensation that the council had requested uh, they'd be provided this evening. Uh, City Attorney Drella. Um, just briefly, as you recall, this was postponed to tonight's meeting, I believe on Alderman Flurry's motion, but uh, the status right now is there was a motion to amend the compensation ordinance to provide that the older persons would be paid on a per meeting basis. So that's the pending motion before this body at this time. Um, the reason it was postponed is I was asked to draft an ordinance of that effect for you to review, which was included uh, in your private packets, as well as 
um, looking at uh, another option that I believe Alderman Fleury had come up with, which is kind of a hybrid, I refer to as a hybrid model, which would provide for a salary basis for all the persons. However, if they miss more than a certain number of meetings, then they would switch to a per meeting basis. Uh, so there was a moment in your packet, and I'd entertain any questions. Anybody have any questions uh, regarding the packet? I know that uh, the city attorney did go on to clarify some of that um, in your um, in his uh, memo, and uh, but it's a pleasure of the council. Alderman Peterson, I would make a motion then, in as much as the pay is expressed as five ninety one ninety two a month based on the four meetings, presumably that we express that the compensation going forward is a flat $148 per meeting that you attend. Okay, we have a motion on the floor. And, and that motion is already on the floor. That was Alderman Stevens' motion from the last meeting. Okay. So you don't need to make the motion. That motion is, I believe, do you have the minutes from last, the last committee meeting, but that was the motion that was on the floor when it was postponed. Okay. I'm assuming it was the same, a per meeting basis, in other words. Well, yes, and then to express express the compensation in you know in in those terms going yeah. forward. That was in the or what the ordinance I provided, correct? Yeah. yeah. Just for clarification. Yeah. Okay. That was Alderman Stevens' motion last <coughs> last meeting. Okay. All right. Uh, do I have a second? It's second. Already on. Okay, second, while the motion was made, we can discount the motion, or I don't know if the council fully understood that there was a motion on the floor before it was made. I, I guess I didn't. Yeah, last, May, last yeah. time this was before committee, it was Alderman Stevens made a motion to uh, switch the compensation to a per meeting basis. There was a second, I don't recall who seconded that offhand. Uh, there was discussion at that point, uh, there was a question about the hybrid topic I just mentioned. And matter is postponed to tonight's meeting. Okay. All right, then we have the uh, mo we have the compensation and expenses uh, for aldermen that the uh, annual sal salary is per meeting uh, is a per meeting basis. Correct. Uh, is there any questions regarding that? Any comments? Uh, Alderman Burton. Thanks, Mayor. So. Um, I was kind of looking, I don't know, I, I wanted to make a motion to amend to include the mayor, clerk, and treasurer in this, but I don't think that's going to be possible if we're doing this on a pay-per-meeting basis. Is there a way we can incorporate mayor, clerk, and treasurer or treasurer into this? I would this? do that as a separate motion. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. Just to make it simpler and cleaner. Okay. Well, I guess my point kind of was that's not going to be possible if we're doing, I mean, we're not going to pay the mayor per meeting. Um, Correct. There would be difficulty there, and I believe I'd have to go back and do the time frames, but the time within which to approve the salaries for the treasurer and the clerk is different than all the persons, um, and that is because our ordinance provides for a term begin date for all the persons. I believe the mayor is the first meeting in May. It's silent as the other two. Um, there's case law that provides that while they may not actually take office, their terms, if the ordinances are silent, begins on the day of the election, which means we're probably within 180 days of that time period already. So we may pass the time with which to amend their salaries, being the treasurer and the clerk. We're past that now, you're saying? We may be, yes. I'd have to research that, but I believe we might be. Good enough. I didn't think it would pass, but it should be brought to attention, maybe. So thank you. Okay. Alderman Albertini, thank, thank you. you. To make it clear to me, what we're looking at is to make the pay per meeting so that you would be paid for every meeting you show up to. The If you, if you open up your packets, and again, I believe this was only in the Alderman's packets because it included a... Uh, some information that was only for them. Um, there's two section 2-38 amendments. 
I believe the first one should read, the annual salary for all older persons shall be $7,103 or $591.92 per month. That's to cover all the older persons whose terms are not expiring this coming May. The second paragraph reads, upon qualification assuming office following the 2025 consolidated election, all the persons shall be paid on a per meeting basis only for those city council or committee or the whole meetings, as well as special meetings of the city council committee whole actually attend at the rate of $140 per meeting. And that is the motion on the floor, that version. Okay, my concern is I notice when elections come up, we have trouble finding anybody to run. There's always a pass on. I'm, I got nobody to run. They just pass on and they're on the board again. Um, a lot of people feel that it's uh, not worth it for them to try to be an alderman because of the expense incurred and the time incurred for the little bit of money. If we're going to deplete this based on if your apps in here or there, I think you're going to deplete the pool for candidates to run for alderman. Um, I don't think we can rely totally on appointments to fill this council. I feel that we need to have people run for the actual seat. And I, I feel that we're going to be discouraging future people from running. The other problem I see is, again, it was brought up that if I don't get paid for being at the meeting, <clears throat> do I not reciprocate the emails and people calling me and stuff for the rest of the week because I'm not being paid for that week? It sounds childish to do that and it's not your duty you are your duty is to represent your constituents but i feel there may be people who might do this and this isn't fair to the constituents to not get responses on a week that their alderman didn't get paid although there is two aldermen per ward they could always resort to the alternate alderman for that ward but i don't feel this is a good idea to bring into play I feel that leaving the salary as current as it is now is the way to go. It's, it's, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, I've been here every meeting, so it really doesn't affect me, and it won't affect me regardless. But this is just how I feel for the rest of the aldermen, that we should just leave it alone. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Fleury. Thank you. <clears throat> Again, not a concern for me. I, I missed three meetings in five years, and two of those are out of the country, so not a concern for me, but concern for the council as a whole. I guess I know you kind of explained the hybrid plan, but it kind of sounded like that would be too messy and not a feasible action plan of saying, like, you can miss three or four or whatever, like a, if you will, a, a sick leave or wh whatever you would call it, um, so there wouldn't be any undo hardship here but try to you know mend both camps here is this, so is that am i reading this correctly that's kind of too messy and wouldn't work or could we make that work my recommendation is not to take that hybrid approach the illinois state statutes and specifically the Illinois municipal code make it very clear that there's two ways to pay older persons per meeting or salary and those are the only two authorized ways period there's no hybrid approach there's no decrease or increase in salaries during a term of office or anything like that other than those pre-approved at the front end um, so there's nothing in state law that allows a method as to what you're suggesting so if we were to try and do that route we'd be utilizing our home rule authority i'm not aware of any other community in the state that has done it that way and i'm not sure it would pass judicial scrutiny I can't say that it wouldn't, but I could very easily say a court saying, hey, you promised to pay them $7,100 a year, and now because they missed a meeting or two, they're having their salaries decreased while other ones haven't. In reality, it sounds a lot like that which is already authorized by state law, which is a per meeting basis. But my recommendation is to stick with the state law in this case because I don't know if anybody else has done it. Excuse me, I don't know if anybody else that's, that's done this hybrid method. Um, and I don't know whether it's stand up to judicial scrutiny. So my recommendation is one or the other, not the hybrid. Then just to follow up, you know, obviously the constituents decide who sit in these seats because they vote for 
us every four years. Mm -hmm. So if a citizen was concerned with their older person's attendance, they could choose not to vote for them. But obviously that takes four years, and if they miss several meetings, that could be an issue. But does a citizen have any other recourse, like to can you recall an alderman if, if it's that concerning to them, or is just every four years is when you make your decisions? The citizens cannot, however, the vacancy portion of the Illinois Municipal Code allows the council to declare a vacancy if an alderman is refusing to come to, come to meetings. Um, we've had that utilized, I believe, once in the last 10 years on one alderman that just simply stopped coming to meetings, so the council declared the seat vacant, if I recall. There was discussion about it doing it at other times, but uh, in those other cases, there were health issues that the council chose not to utilize that section because that older person did have significant health issues that prevented them from coming to the meetings, and they actually did come once or twice during that, their illness. So um, there is a mechanism by which the council, if there's an older person that refuses to come to meetings, can direct them to come. If they don't, declare the seat vacant. It probably doesn't address the situation with the alderman that misses one or two meetings every month. In other words, they keep coming, but just skips a meeting here and there because that's not, it's obviously not abandonment of office. They're coming, just not as much as they should. Right, but is there a, a set limit or number before you, the council could take action, or it's no. just whenever somebody brings it up? Nope, there's not. All right, thank you. That's for why it's a, dangerous, it's a dangerous provision to use. Alderman Peterson? I would point out the municipal league on or the attorney general's online training on the Open Meetings Act does allow aldermen under certain conditions to attend by video, by video means. No, it does not. It allows a city to adopt an ordinance to permit that. The city of Belvedere has not done that. Okay. And again, that would require somebody that's out legitimately out of town and not, you know, has there's certain delineated reasons why that would be able to be done and maybe maybe that's something we should should do should consider we looked at that in the past and the council decided not to do that but we could and certainly the open means act does allow a city to adopt an ordinance specifying specific reasons why an alderman can attend remotely and also limits the number of meetings they could do that way and the council did attend uh, remotely during uh, covid correct yep those were during the special meetings and special rules are in place during covid and it was a nightmare. Alderman Freeman was there and can remember not being able to hear anybody because it just didn't work real well. <laughs> okay. Alderwoman Gramkowski. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I guess re regarding the pay and the, compens and the commitment, I don't really know anybody that runs for an office for the pay of this. If they do, that's kind of crazy. I think they should be running for the commitment and if you can't make the commitment, you shouldn't run. Just my personal opinion. Okay. Uh, Alderwoman Frank. Thank you, Mayor. I think the county does it per meeting, correct? They do. Do they still do it that way? No, they did it one time. No, they still do. Yes, they, they do. Other woman, Graham Kowski. Thank you, Mayor. I just have one more comment. Um, for those that are here, it doesn't impact them. You made the commitment, you're here. The only ones it impacts are those that don't show. So I don't know why we wouldn't do this. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Hearing, uh, do you wish to restate the motion on the floor? Survey is clear. Or? The annual sell, the annual salary for an alder, for an alder person shall be seventy one hundred and three dollars, or five hundred ninety one dollars and ninety two cents per month, um, upon qualification. Assuming office following the twenty twenty five consolidated election, alder persons shall be paid on a per meeting basis only for those city council or committee of the whole meetings as well as any special meetings of the city council or committee of the whole actually attended at the rate of $148 per meeting. In accordance with section nine of article seven of the 
1970 Constitution of the State of Illinois in Section 3.150-5 of the Illinois Municipal Code, all the person whose term of office expires in 2027 following the 2027 consolidated election shall continue to be paid at the rate set forth in Subsection A until the term of office expires after the 27 consolidated election. And just so everybody knows, this will, if it's approved, come back in ordinance form. Okay. All right. Uh, we have the motion on the floor. That is the motion. Uh, if there are no other comments, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 And opposed? Nay. Nay. Uh, let's do a roll call, please. <coughs> Albertini? Nay. Brereton? Aye. Flurry? Nay. Frank? Aye. Freeman? Nay. Gramkowski? Aye. McGee? Nay. Mulhall? Nay. Peterson? Aye. Stevens? Aye. Five in favor? Motion passed. Uh, mayor votes. Motion passed. Okay. All righty. Um, moving on, we have item six, other new business. Just a quick question. Is that, I'm sorry, you said motion passed. It was 5-5. Five, five. Yes. Does that mean you voted yes? Yes. Okay, sorry, just for clarification. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, item six, other new business. Uh, item A, an appointment of Erica Bluji uh, as city clerk to fill the vacancy created by the resignation of Sarah Turnipseed. Um, in your packet was a memo from myself uh, dated October 8th regarding uh, the appointment of Eric, Erica to the city clerk to fill the vacancy created by the resignation of Sarah for the remainder of the term of office. Uh, it states, I offer my appointment of Erica Bluji as city clerk for the remainder of the current term of office to fill the vacancy created by Sarah's turnip seeds resignation. I would ask for a motion consenting to the appointment of Erica Bluji as the city clerk for the remainder of the current term. Motion by Alderman uh, Fleury, second by Alderwoman Gramkowski. Uh, any discussion regarding the motion? Okay, hearing none, uh, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 And any opposed? Okay, motion passed, thank you. We have item 6B, the amendment to Article 9 of Chapter 98 relating to small cell deployment in the right-of-way. In your packet was a memo from the city attorney, Mike Drella, uh, dated uh, October 9, 2024, uh, which is an amendment to Article 9 of Section uh, chap of Chapter 98 relating to the small cell deployment in the right-of-way. Uh, city attorney? Um, so as you remember, I don't recall small cell, you're talking about uh, basically the 5G rollout. You're talking about the smaller facilities that are placed on top of existing light poles, telephone poles, things like that. We're not talking about big towers. Um, federal law and state law was amended. I thought it was funny, huh? <laughs> federal law and state law years ago. Years ago it was amended to provide that cities don't have the authority, just prohibit them. And specifically limited what authority cities and villages do have to regulate small cell rollout with across the state and across the nation. Um, and they keep tweaking their requirements and their allowed regulations, and they did that again, so we have to mind our ordinances to comply with both federal and state law. So the ordinance, or I should say the amended code sections that were included in my memo, are essentially what IML is recommending in their model ordinances for everybody to adopt to comply with both federal and state law. You'll be seeing, once this comes back in ordinance form, also some changes to the zoning code to reflect the same kinds of changes that occur on private property, because these can occur on both private property and the rights of way. Um, nothing of it is actually particularly 
exciting or interesting other than some changes in definitions as to who's allowed to apply for the um, uh, the permits and things like that and, and actually it doesn't really change anything it just makes it clear that uh, basically an agent can apply on behalf of the owner of the facility um, and defines utility pole um, and then IML inserted some suggested language. It would be on the fourth page of the ordinance. Um, the federal rules now diverge from the state statute as to how long a city or village has within which to process an application. And the federal rule is actually shorter than the state law. So we have to comply with the federal law, and that's what this change does. But if at some point the federal law changes, then we can default back to the state statute. And that's why there's that new addition is we'll comply with the more strict federal law because we're required to. Um, but if for some reason they all have sunset clauses on it, that federal law goes away, then we'll comply with the easier state law. So. Alderman Peterson. That was one thing I was going to ask is, <clears throat> is if on page five, if that, uh, that uh, paragraph B in section or uh, Number three, if we could restore the 30 days to, to 10. 10 seems like it's inordinately short time. It is very difficult. No, we cannot. How many of these installations do we have now then? Almost none. I'm not aware of any downtown. Public works position is, is we don't want them. So and when we, have, we receive inquiries, um, um, we try to dissuade those those individuals as best we can to find alternate locations. Belvedere is lucky and unlucky, I guess. We're lucky in the sense that the majority of our light poles are owned by ComEd, not us. So we tell them to go talk to ComEd. Um, and there aren't too many of our poles are actually high enough that they want. So we've been lucky that way. All right. Uh, before we get carried away here, I guess... Uh, I would need a motion uh, to that to that effect. The motion to amend Article 9 of Chapter 98 is set forth in the draft code as presented. I'm going to get a motion, please. Motion by Alderman Peterson and a second by Alderman Frank. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, with um, these small antennas, I know that uh, 5G, um, was it T-Mobile, had been out here with a, with a um, demonstration on some of the wireless 5G and uh, so I think uh, they would be probably a third-party attachment on, as you said, the utility poles are most of all of them are owned by ComEd, and that would be an attachment on their equipment. So Alderwoman Freeman. Thank you. So I don't know, are we looking at, um, I don't know who, if it was like Frontier or Xfinity or who put in those um, metal boxes? About frontier. That's Frontier. Are we talking about those, and are those in compliance, or will they have to be moved? Mm -hmm. there? Completely separate. That's those We're only for the fiber on the ground. Yep. Yeah, that's for hardwired fiber. Okay. And this will be for uh, wireless connectivity, so that they don't have any. You know, they they the more the, the small antennas they get up, the less dead spots they have, and the more they could utilize uh, wireless 5G. Any other, any other questions uh, on the motion on the floor? Hearing none, all those in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 And any opposed? Motion passed. Thank you. And we'll move to item C, amendment to section 43-43, nepotism prohibited of the City of Belvedere. Um, in your packet is a memo from the City Attorney, Mike Drella, dated October 7th, 2024 as well, uh, regarding an amendment to Section 4343, Nepotism Prohibited of the Municipal Code. I had asked um, Mike to look at this. Um, we already have uh, situations in the city where we are Essentially, uh, we would disqualify, disqualify ourselves from a nepotism that we have on the books. Um, also, 
I know that uh, the police department has had a very difficult time uh, to be able to hire individuals. I think we've talked about this in the past. Uh, the police department has had in the past uh, 125, maybe 150, somewhere around there, 100 to 150 anyhow, uh, applicants uh, whenever we have an opening. Um, so because we already have a violation in our nepotism, uh, essentially in our um, employment with nepotism, uh, we haven't been consistent. And that can happen by maybe not even hiring. That can happen by, for instance, if uh, individuals uh, become uh, married, for instance, would be one way that that could happen. So I looked at it. I also thought that... Um, I want to make sure that public safety, uh, that we don't lose good uh, public safety applicants uh, for any department. <coughs> They're hard to come by, and uh, we certainly have had a very, very difficult time uh, as of late. But it doesn't mean that uh, because individuals <coughs> are related, we already know that because we, it already occurs, but individuals that may be related uh, that they're not good employees or they can't be good employees and they can't satisfy a public safety uh, need, especially with the departments, potentially police department and fire department, uh, first responders that uh, I think is vital. And uh, so I'll let the city attorney comment on what he has put together in, regard, in regards to that. So attached to the memo was uh, some recommended modified language to section 43-43 of the city's code. And the changes are shown in underlying strikeout, underlying being additions to the existing code and uh, strikeout being deletions. Um, the code was adopted, this ordinance was adopted in 1999, so it's been on the books for a very long time, um, prior to my time, frankly. Um, and the concept is good. You don't want somebody's brother being the boss of their sibling you don't want somebody's father or parent being the boss of their child, things like that. And you certainly don't want them necessarily hiring their kids or their siblings for the state of work. You, you obviously leads to some, at the very least, bad public publicity and can be worse. Um, and I think that's what the original ordinance tried to do, but where it kind of ran in some problems when they, is when they got into that subsection B where it said that no officer employee shall and said supervise and manage the work of a family member. Didn't have the word directly in it. And where that creates problems is you could have an employee, for example, in the public works department, the street department, that might have a relative that's a foreman in another department, the, uh, the street department, and that creates, however, because one is still a supervisor, the other one's a worker bee, and there are times when that foreman, for example, in a snow emergency, might be called upon to supervise that other employee, um, would create a problem. Um, you can see that becoming more, more of an issue where if they're both employed, and they're both union employees, and one of them tests and is promoted through the testing process, and under the union contract guaranteed that right of promotion, and all of a sudden, they create a conflict with this code. So it also creates the situation, for example, as the mayor said, you might have somebody that works for the city. Uh, they may have a parent that wants to test with the city to gain employment in a department. And if they're hired, there's no violation of the code because they're at the same level. Well, what happens, for example, if it's in the fire department and all of a sudden one of them tests and earn a promotion to lieutenant? Well, even if they're on different shifts, the ordinance is originally written, well, not entirely clear, it seems to suggest that that person can be a lieutenant. So what the amendment tries to do is say, number one, we're gonna preserve that no person will ever be involved in the employment, the appointment, the promotion, the transfer, or the promotion of any other employee that they're related to. And that just shouldn't happen. We, I think we can all agree on that one. However, it changes that subsection B to put in the word directly supervise and then define what that means. So that if you had a sergeant with a 
spouse or a child that was in the department that sergeant was on a different shift not responsible for the day-to-day -day supervision of that employee that would be okay and the reason why I put in day-to-day is there might be times on emergency callback when yeah they're at the same spot at the same time but in day-to-day -day operations they would not be responsible for supervising their relative um, it also would allow for the situation for example if you had a deputy chief in the fire department which doesn't exist yet um, and their nephew or their child wanted to test for the fire department as long as they weren't responsible for any of the advancement promotion hiring or discipline of that person and there's an intervening rank between the two that would be okay I don't see that happening very often that's much less likely than your kind of lateral moves where somebody gets married or you want to hire a brother or sibling or something like that and then the last change in subsection D um, the original ordinance didn't define what a family member is does that include second cousins third cousins first cousins what so I put in there a fairly standard definition of what a family member is being a spouse a civil union partner a child a sibling a parent an uncle an aunt a nephew a niece grandparent grandson or granddaughter um, basically trying to get kind of a close more nuclear unit and not going out past really cousins so any questions all the woman drink I have a couple of questions so um, I know what nepotism is obviously but um, can we do this only because we're home rule or are there other communities that already are doing this this has nothing to do with home rule or non home rule authority so are it's there a fairly other, common thing it's common okay yeah. so are there any safeguards in place that if it didn't work that we'd have to come in I like if, it, if it's not working out or something if what's not working out I'm sorry I don't understand the question okay I think, um, I think what you may be trying to say is that if with the safeguards that are built into this um, you I think what you're anticipating probably wouldn't happen I believe that uh, um, you know that that wouldn't be an issue because there, as it is as it says here um, regarding uh, supervision and um, you know the day-to-day -day direct supervision of an employee with no intervening layer of supervisory personnel so I think that uh, that helps as I as I said keep in mind um, I realize how difficult it is um, and there are individuals I think that uh, probably are very capable that uh, would apply had uh, if we can work it out so that they can uh, also be hired uh, and that the nepotism uh, certainly can be um, made less uh, or actually be eliminated and, and in this uh, language I think it does Alderman Albertine thank you the, the amendment to this or a municipal code would this affect anybody who's currently employed yeah it actually bring into compliance an existing situation mm -hmm. it would it would bring it into compliance I, I don't want to get into specifics or details because of privacy concerns but we already found out you know I didn't even think about it frankly because this has been on the book since 99 and it really comes up uh, we already have one department where there's a mid-level manager who has a spouse um, that is of a lower call it rank if you will um, in a different section of the same department you know so he's not they're not supervising each other um, not involved in, in reviewing their performance or anything like that nor have any same promotion or discipline or anything like that but yeah it's there and technically I think I probably want to follow this ordinance so this, so ordinance. this person would eventually then be displaced from its position um, actually we wouldn't be able to do it because the union concerns okay <laughs> thank you mm -hmm. Alderman Peterson it looks like the primary group in, in impacted by this are going to be the agreement people yep and it, do any of the agreements now cover any of the, the nepotism issues because it, it seems like maybe it would be something within their their interest being wages hours terms and conditions of employment they do not um, mostly because nobody looks at the base code when they're doing the agreements and um, you know you're talking about outside of the Public Works Department you're talking all police and fire commission 
appointments and and um, promotions, and they control all that. So in theory, they shouldn't promote somebody if they look at this, but they may not even know that's an issue until it's too late. Um, class example, um, after, after uh, realizing a potential hire that they're considering, I had to point this out to the Fire and Police Commission, and one of the commission members will have to recuse himself from considering an appointment because it turns out it's a grandchild of that commission member. So they're going to go through that process to do that, and even under the amendment, they'd still have to recuse themselves and leave the room. But, uh, but yeah, it, it does happen, and, and no, it's not in the collective bargaining agreements. Will it be made one? Not if we fix this. <laughs> Alderwoman Freeman. Thank you. So um, maybe Section D could include son-in-laws and daughter-in-laws as well. Um, I think maybe some guys might be inclined to hire their son-in-law. Um, or they might be inclined to come down harder on their son-in-law if they get divorced from their daughter or, how, you know. <laughs> so I'm just saying that those are actually immediate family members in my family. I missed that one. I can certainly do that the commission or the committee desires. And as I was doing it, I'm trying to think, which one am I forgetting? <laughs> I think we still need a motion, don't we, Madam Clerk? Uh, yeah, we need a motion uh, on the floor. Um, if we can get a motion to amend uh, Section 4343 as set forth in the memo dated October 7, 2024, uh, that will come back in ordinance form. I could have a motion to that effect, uh, and if the motion by Alderman Peterson, second by Alderman Gramkowski, would uh, the motioners include, or would you have an amendment to that motion then, uh, Mike? If there's general consent, uh, general consent to add uh, son-in-law, son daughter-in-law. Daughter okay, okay, I'll put that in for the final ordinance. It comes back for ordinance form. Okay. Alderman Fleury. Would you also have to add grandson-in-law and granddaughter-in-law, or is that going too far down the road here? That's up to you guys, but. Alderwoman Gramkowski. If you just said in-laws, would that encompass the whole I'd probably gamut? do that. I don't know if that would, that would probably would not get down to the grandson-in-law and granddaughter-in-law. It's up to the council how far down you want to get. I guess the question is, how often is that likely to occur? But mm -hmm. I got in there. Mm -hmm. I think uh, probably the. I mean, it's up to you. Whatever you want to put in there. In laws to the second degree. <laughs> well, I just think if we're including again, that makes a good point that we kind of overlooked. If you're talking about son-in-laws and daughter-in-laws, I yeah. think you mm -hmm. know the the generational gap is shrinking to where you have grandsons and granddaughters in law. So I think we just include that that way we just cover all of our bases. And I don't think that's getting too far in the weeds. Is there consensus for that? Alderman McGee? Yeah, where does uh, step uh, parents and stepchild fall into this? Okay. Be in agreement with that? I can't cover that on a child, but you're right, they may not be adopted. All right, anyone, anybody else? Okay. Uh, we have a motion on the floor then. Um, if there's no other discussion on the motion, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passed. Thank you. We will note those 
changes when it comes back. All right, uh, last but not least, certainly item D, acceptance of donation for police department in your packet is a memo from Chief Woody dated October 14, 2024. Uh, for a motion to accept donation, Chief. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, please turn to the memo in your packet uh, uh, requesting uh, and acknowledging receipt of a $50 donation from the Asa Cottrell chapter, Daughters of the American Revolution. I would uh, uh, request a motion to accept the donation of $50, check number 1344, from the Asa Cottrell chapter, Daughters of the American Revolution. Okay, motion by Alderwoman Frank, thank you. Second by Alderman Peterson, thank you both. Any comments, any questions uh, regarding the motion on the floor? All right, hearing none, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. Aye. And if there's any opposed, motion passed, thank you. And that is all we have on the agenda for this evening. Could I have a motion to adjourn, please? Motion by Alderman Albertini, second by Alderman Frank. Thank you both. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Anybody want to stay? For the record, uh, we adjourned at 7.31 p.m. Thank you, everybody. Have a good evening. What's left of it?